Hello again. <clears throat> Felix Mendelssohn thoroughly enjoyed his, his first grand tour of Italy in 1830, despite the fact that he had some mixed views about what he saw and heard when he was there. When he was in Venice, he, he immersed himself in Renaissance art, and um, which he liked very much. But on the painting, he, on the music he heard there, he, he wrote, I have not heard a single note worth remembering. When he was in Naples, he concluded that the orchestras were shoddy, um, and the traditional Roman Catholic liturgical music pretty much, well, it was pretty much impenetrable, impenetrable to him. Nevertheless, the sights and sounds of Italy inspired what was to become one of his most popular works. So let's begin this video where we left off with Mendelssohn's Symphony No. 4, The Italian. The, the third movement is a, is a lovely flowing minuet that some say is a musical equivalent of the, the restrained beauty and symmetrical tones of some of the architecture Mendelssohn admired so much when he was in Italy. And as for the finale, well, it's the only movement that, musically speaking, has, has its roots in Italy. Uh, because it, it features hints of a fast Italian dance called the Saltarello. And there's also rhythms that are associated with another dance, the Tarantella. By the way, did you know that the Tarantella is traditionally associated with the, the victim of spider bites? Anyway, let's hear the last two minutes of Mendelssohn's Fourth Symphony, um, again played by the Phil Philharmonia Orchestra under Otto Klemperer.
The Italian Symphony. You know, I, I, I hesitated about, about featuring such a popular, well-known program, uh, piece of music rather, in, in this program, but I'm glad I did. Uh, when, I, when I was planning this program, I actually listened to three recordings of, of that piece of music, um, and each one sounded quite different. Anyway, aren't we spoiled by um, things these days, pandemic apart? We have cheap flights and high-speed trains and excellent roads, all making the whole business of travelling to and from and around Europe relatively inexpensive and, and indeed ple pleasurable. Obviously travel was completely different in the days of the Grand Tour. Uh, on the plus side, uh, Grand Tourists didn't concern, them, can concern themselves with, with their baggage allowance. They took everything but their kitchen sink with them, clothes for all occasions, books, furniture and, and servants, and they didn't agonise about duty-free either. They, they often returned home with as much as they possibly could. Um, however, getting around was by no means easy. First you had to cross the, the channel. And that often meant waiting for days on end for a fair wind. And then there was the state of the roads when you crossed the channel. Someone once said that travelling on 19th century roads in Germany required, quotes, a, a good constitution and Christian patience. And how about the costs? Well, I recently read the credit card firm MBNA calculated that James Cecil, the 6th Earl of Salisbury, spent today's equivalent of £478,000 on his Grand Tour in the 18th century. Half a million quid. Other Grand Tourists of the period happily forked out as much as £700,000. And you have to remember there were no credit cards in those days. Grand Tourists often travelled with gold in a pouch and, and an often misplaced hope that they would not fall prey to robbers and highwaymen and so forth. One of the big attractions of the Grand Tour was the Venice Carnival, uh, which I suppose was the Edinburgh festival of its day with public shows and exhibitions and musicians and dancers and acrobats and jugglers all, all doing their thing. It also featured rafish parties and performances in private houses and, and theatres would host mask plays. Um, and other things went on too. Um, 
the, the carnival helped to make Casanova famous, for example. In 1734, Thomas Osborne, the fourth Duke of Leeds, arrived in, in Venice for the start of the carnival opera season and he found himself besotted by the singing of a castrato called Carlo Brosci, who, who was known by the stage name Farinelli. Now, Farinelli was to become famous and, and a very wealthy singer. Um, it, it's, it's said that there are few, there have been few more popular singers in the world of opera. And so Thomas Osborne teamed up with, with some of his pals, some of his grand tourist colleagues, all fans of Farinelli, and they organised an itinerary following the, sin the singer as he performed throughout Italy. And when he returned to England, um, Thomas Osborne became one of Farinelli's main patrons and he was instrumental in, in him travelling to London to sing in Johann Hasse's 1730 opera, Arta Cersei. So let's hear a, an aria from that opera that Farinelli would have sung in London. This is Sol Qual Navi, which ship is it? A song that was actually written by Farinelli's brother Riccardo. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I couldn't find a recording by a castrato, so here we have the great Cecilia Bartoli exhibiting some of the, the vocal gymnastics with the ensemble Il Giardino Armonico, taking her along at uh, quite a lick. Um, as, I, as I'm looking for this, I, I, I will add that this isn't my sort of thing. Uh, it may or may not be yours, but I think, I hope you'll see that, that it's part of the story of the Grand Tour. Oh, <laughs> 
Isn't that extraordinary? That's Miss Bartoli pretending she's Farinelli with castrato. I wonder if I could sing like that if I was castrated. <laughs> anyway, um, that concludes this video. It's a bit shorter than, than most, but there's some more music in, in video three, and this music will have a, a grand tour connection with Stravinsky and with, very remotely, Perth Concert Hall. Thank you.